Hello everyone. My name is Bill Swainson and on behalf of the LitFest Board of Trustees, I'd like to welcome you to this last event in LitFest's autumn weekend. Sarah would have been with us on the 8th of October to launch her novel had not COVID intervened. And we are particularly grateful that a month later she's recovered sufficiently and can join us today. So tonight is a launch. And if you're lucky enough not yet to have read Burnt Coat, you're in for a treat. But first, a word about LitFest. LitFest is a volunteer-run arts charity. And while we have essential support from Lancaster City Council and occasional project grants, if we're to be able to go on creating um, exciting events and bringing the best in world literature to the Northwest, then we're going to go on needing your help. So towards the end of the event, a donate button will appear on your screen. Please do click on it before you leave. Every gift will help us to build towards a hybrid future where we will be able to meet physically or digitally as suits us best. And you can also support us by buying Burnt Coat and other books from the LitFest online bookshop. And now it's a real pleasure for the second time this year to um, introduce the novelist and short story writer, Sarah Hall. Sarah was born in Carlisle, as many of you will know, twice nominated for the Man Booker Prize. She's one of the most highly praised novelists writing today. She's also been four times nominated for the BBC um, Short Story Award, and not just nominated, but won it twice. And you can find her 2020 winner, The Grotesques, in her collection, Sudden Traveller. Most of her six novels are set in the Northwest, including Hawes Water, The Carhullen Army and The Wolf Border. And just a month ago, her outstanding new novel, Burnt Coat, um, is also set in the region, was published. Garlanded with advanced praise from Daisy Johnson, Sarah Moss, Andrew Miller, Benjamin Myers and Sarah Perry, author of The Essex Serpent, who called it an extraordinary work that will stand as a blazing witness to the age that bore it. So please give a very warm digital welcome to Sarah Hall. Now, tonight we are going to talk about Burnt Coat and perhaps also a little about the Kahalan Army, which shares some things in common with it. But for now, let's plunge straight in. So Sarah, would you like to read from the opening of the book? Yes, and thank you very much. Apologies to everyone who was uh, hoping for a month, a month ago's event, um, but it's very nice to be here and feeling better <laughs> uh, this evening. So I'll just uh, read from the early pages of the novel. Um, and really this section just gives an indication um, about the formation of the main character, Edith. When I was eight, my mother died and Naomi arrived. My father still lived with us then. We had a house at the edge of town on one of the steep streets that lead up to the beacon from which the interior mountains can be seen. It was a few days before Christmas. The summits were snow-capped and the air was cold and paper thin. We were shopping for gifts and my father had brought the car. The doll's house I wanted was very large, too big to carry, so I was sure it would be bought. My mother had been complaining all day of a headache. Every shop we went into made her wince. These lights are so bright. She kept dragging her feet and sitting down, rubbing her forehead. We'd been to the old civic library and unusually for her, she'd borrowed no books. My father was annoyed. Why did you come out with a migraine? Do you want to go home? On the walk back to the car, she stumbled. My father was walking a little ahead to start the car and turn on the heating. He did not see. She lost her balance and fell to the pavement kneeling for a moment in the slush, then leaning over and sitting. Adam, she called. Where is Edith? Is she there? She sounded very calm. Her words were slow. Adam, I can't see her. I thought she was starting an interesting game. She could be very silly and playful. 
I'm not over here, mummy, I said, walking round behind her, and I'm not over here. She held up a hand, carefully touched the air. I can't see. I squatted down in front of her, stared, moved my head around. Her eyes did not follow. One iris seemed like a black planet. Dad, I called. My father walked back to us. Move out of the way, he said. What is going on, Naomi? Why are you sitting there getting filthy? She raised her arms and my father took hold and hauled her up. When he let go, she swayed, sagged again. He walked her across the car park, opened the door of the Volvo and helped her onto the back seat. With every step, she lost power like a toy running out of battery. She lay quietly on the red leather, her eyes wide and empty. Get in the front, he told me. This was the first time I'd been allowed in the passenger seat. I clicked the metal seat belt into its lock. It was baggy, set for an adult. My father started the car and drove unhurriedly, stopping at the traffic lights. For some reason, I thought we were just going home. I kept turning to look behind. My mother was breathing rapidly, her eyelids beginning to droop. She tried to talk, but the words were babyish sounds. There was a clicking in her gullet. I looked again and her face was in a pool of lumpy liquid. Mum's been sick, she's being sick. Okay, thank you, Edith, my father said. I was not scared. Nobody in the car seemed scared by what was happening. Now, turn round and sit down. He drove to the infirmary, pulled up to the main emergency door and put on the handbrake. Stay here, he said to me. I want to come in too. No, he said, but I want to come in with mummy. He reached across the gear stick and smacked me on the top of the legs, an awkward pluffing whack that stung through my skirt and tights. And then he got out of the car, walked into the hospital and came out with a porter and a wheelchair. They slid Naomi from the back seat, lifted her into the chair and I watched her being pushed inside, her body listing over. My eyes were watering, the tears refracted everything and for a moment there were two leaning women in two wheelchairs. I blinked and one was gone. The car smelled sour. The passenger window bloomed coldly under my palm. An ambulance pulled up next to the car and the paramedics unloaded a stretcher. When my father came back, he did not apologise. I said nothing as he moved the car into a parking space. He steered me silently inside the building, his hand pressing between my shoulder blades. I was given children's books by the receptionist. You look like a clever girl, she said. I bet you can read these all by yourself. I listened to her speaking to the doctors, speaking to my father, speaking into the phone. They were planning to move my mother to another hospital as quickly as possible. While my father was in the toilet, I slipped over to the receptionist and asked if I could see my mother. Oh, no, Poppet, you can't. She's very sick. They have to do an operation. What's wrong with her? I asked. Is it her headache? The receptionist nodded, looking pleased, as if I'd answered a school question right. Yes, Poppet. She's got a blood clot on her brain. Oh, here we are. The sound of the helicopter approaching was unmistakable. The furious blades, air thumping beside the building as it landed. Suddenly, I realised everything was serious. Helicopters were used to rescue climbers who'd fallen from the ridges. They were used to save lives. For a minute, I thought we would all be going, and I was lit by excitement and fear. I'd never flown before. But almost immediately, the helicopter lifted again, even louder, it seemed, its rotors whining, a blaze of deafening noise. Soon it was a faraway drone. My father took me home, made toast and asked me to go to bed. I need you to be a big girl, Edith. I lay looking at the luminous stars stuck to my bedroom ceiling. In the morning, he told me my mother had been airlifted to Newcastle and a surgery performed. She would have to spend several weeks in hospital. 
it was a very complicated operation. They've had to do some things that mean she won't be for herself for a while. She might not even know who you are. He was wearing the same clothes as the day before. His eyes were puffy. His whole face seemed puffy, the features gathering closely inside it. Yes, she will know who I am, I said. He shook his head. She's unconscious. Christine's mum's going to look after you today. We spent Christmas, just the two of us, miserably eating mince pies. The tree was undecorated. Only its smell was festive and reassuring. There was no doll's house. My father had hastily bought me a coat, the tag still in. On Boxing Day, he drove over to the hospital again. I was made a fuss of by Christine's parents, given chocolates and milk. Christine asked if my mum was going to die. I lied and told her I'd ridden in the helicopter. When my father arrived to pick me up, I heard him speaking quietly to Christine's mother as I collected my shoes and coat. It's like Frankenstein, he said. It's absolutely horrendous. Every few days he made the journey across the country. I kept asking when I could see her. Not yet, was all he'd say. She's not well, she doesn't remember. On my first visit to the rehabilitation centre, my mother was sitting at a table drawing a picture. There was a strip of stubble in her hair containing a vast raised caterpillar scar. One side of her face seemed pulled back and lifted. I stood in the doorway, too scared to approach. Go on, my father said. You want to come? I'll get a coffee. He was not looking at my mother and hadn't said hello to her. He walked away down the corridor. My mother didn't seem to notice me. She had on pale blue pyjamas with white snowflakes that made her look younger. A nurse entered the room behind her. You must be Edith. Your mummy's been missing you. Come in. She walked me to the table, pulled out a chair for me. I sat. The nurse gently placed a scarf round my mother's head covering the, pur the curved purple welt and tied it at the back. There we go. But I couldn't unsee the awful wound. The picture was childish, a tree or a figure. My mother seemed confused about the line she was making, which direction it should continue in. I took the pencil from her. She looked at me. Her expression was blank and curious like a bird assessing an item on the ground. I finished the line, drew a nest on the branch with spotted eggs inside. Her mouth opened and closed a few times, popping wetly. With concentrated, almost physical effort, she said, ah, na, me. I looked at the nurse, who smiled. What is she saying, I asked. The nurse put her hands on my mother's shoulders, stopped the swaying motion that had begun to increase. She's introducing herself. She's saying, I'm Naomi. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, now, Burnt Coat is a visionary novel written in what might, one might call the future elegiac. It's a brilliant, um, it's brilliant about artistic creation, equally so about sex, love, death and grief, and creates a fully imagined world with a few deft strokes, one that is a bit like our own during the present pandemic, but then taken a step further. It will, I assure you, if you haven't read it already, take your breath away. Now, Sarah, very near the beginning uh, of the novel, Edith, the narrator, says, you were the last one here before I closed the doors of Burnt Coat, before we all shut our doors. Can you tell us a little bit about what Burnt Coat is and what was the spark that started the whole novel off? Ah, well... <laughs> Uh, Burnt Coat in the novel is the name of a building. It's the name of Edith's home, which is also her studio. Um, but in the way of these things, sometimes 
place names take on a kind of significance and a metaphoric significance. And certainly that's the case for Edith's life and her work. Um, so the name does resonate across her, her kind of art as well. She's using a burnt wood technique for her work. Um, but there are also aspects of the novel. It's, you know, dealing with a pandemic, a different kind of virus from the one that we've been experiencing over the last two years. Uh, the virus that I um, invented, I suppose, for the purposes of this novel, comes with a very high fever, which is fatal or or not. But even if it's not, you can't, you don't quite escape the virus. So the sense of um, being burnt and damaged uh, kind of resonates through the whole novel, but it's not quite as grim as that. It's um, if we go back to the art form that Edith uses, it is all about making something more resilient and durable and waterproof. She uses this technique to protect the wood she's using. So burnt coat, I suppose, um, has a kind of greater metaphoric significance for the whole novel and for the whole idea of human experience going through these traumas and coming out the other end altered but resilient. And what made you first decide or want to create an artist as your main character? And, and why sculpture? Yeah, um, I think there are lots of different partial answers to the question. Um, one, I suppose, thinking about current affairs. I mean, the book was begun during the first lockdown in March 2020. And I felt the I felt impelled to write um, as a response to what was going on. But I was also kind of questioning that in some ways and thinking, what good is this? What good is writing? What good is art in these moments? It would be more useful to, you know, volunteer and do something practical in this situation. So I suppose there was a sense of wanting to question the nature of art in relation to human experience, especially the big ones. And again, I was thinking about the grand scale of what was happening um, and on the walks I was doing around Norwich at that point, and uh, I was kind of passing war memorials and thinking, you know, this is how people have been commemorated, you know, the great losses that, that humans have experienced are sort of commemorated with these pieces. And I have a degree in art history, so again, it was a way of kind of approaching the uses, the purposes of art in relation to expressing our human experience, but also being able to do it in a different way from just writing about a writer, writing about a pandemic. Um, and I am very interested in, in art anyway, and um, particularly aspects of art uh, that have been underwritten or underexplored and areas of art that are not necessarily or haven't necessarily been populated by women artists and land art is one of those areas. So a, a, a land artist of very large scale, it's quite unusual to find a woman working in that field. And that was exciting to me because I like to create these female characters which take up space in history. They are history makers, um, you know, they're reintroducing wolves or they're, they're creating a national monument for a pandemic. They're sort of capable um, and getting on with it. And I suppose in that taking up space, if you think about Edith's constructs that she's making, they are very large, they're very significant. So it was um, multiple things, kind of my old preoccupations with art and art history and responding to what was going on and, and trying to get a handle on um, how art can respond to such things. Thank you. I mean, one of the one of the sculptures that is um, that is made is, um, in fact, uh, Edith is working on it um, when she when she first meets Hallett is the is the Aesop fable of the um, the, the wolf and the stork um, that the wolf has a bone um, which is choking him in his throat and only the stork has a bill long enough to get it out, mm. um, and that's a I, I mean, we can't see that sculpture, but you make it real for us in a way, and it's also sort of seems to be at the at the crux of the book that that this this very precarious balance that we have in being alive. Um, one of the disadvantages of um, doing an online event is we can't suddenly turn to the audience and say, 
how many of you have read the book and how many haven't because <laughs> I want I want to make sure that everyone has an idea of how the book works um, but at the same time for people who haven't read it we don't want to give everything away either um, but but let's say that that sentence I quoted from you uh, from the beginning of the book you were the last one here before I closed the doors of burnt coat before we all shut our doors so the two lovers have, have only recently met and the, the, the pandemic which you give a wonderfully sort of simple scientific name to ag3 Eventually. has just has has just uh, arrived and um so suddenly that the world in which lovers meet which is kind of an enclosed world i mean i, re I remember there's a wonderful scene in dh lawrence's the rainbow when the when the two, the, the couple at the beginning discover um discover each other and discover sex and there is a there is a intense sort of 10 day period when that is what they're doing and you you create this this world in which these two lovers um can inhabit but it's also a world of disaster it's the, the pandemic has arrived and if anyone if 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 the wolf or the stork make a wrong move they end up dead so <laughs> death is never far from us um i i i wonder if you could just talk a little bit about how you got to that to that stage where you had so many themes running at the same time yeah um i think because it's a you know a reasonably short novel it, it had to compress it still had to be dimensional so all novels are dimensional and and hopefully working on multiple levels and life seemed compressed during that first lockdown you know people were thrown in together and there was a sense of a kind of a, a cauldron if you like and and everything all your experiences up to that point whatever they may be if you were 80 or 18 were brought with you into these confinements um and so it felt like if i was going to write a novel about confinement and and one part of the book has a lockdown then everything needed to be brought into it in the way that we did bring all our experiences into the lockdowns that we were experiencing too um so they become kind of enclosed spaces which in some ways might suit new lovers um you know this private world you create between the two of you i think edith at one point says you know that's what new lovers do anyway. They create their own little worlds that they exist in and they start to decorate them and, and have hope and trust in them. Um, so in some ways, like a short story, there needed to be that kind of compression. But actually in this book, the, the functional compression is there of lockdown. Um, but it, it can't just be an artificial story where that's the only thing. The whole of life needed to kind of come into the lockdown scenario as it did with all of us, I think. So it was a question of, in some ways, like a short story, um, condensing things, distilling things, the whole of a life's experience. And, and Burnt Coat is, is Edith's whole life experience kind of distilled down into small moments, um, particular moments, especially particular moments where there's almost like a kind of globe that you can see into and, and see what happened in her life and watch it happening. Right, thank you. Now, Hallett, the lover, is a is a very engaging character, and we believe in that love affair completely in its intensity and 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 so on. But it's interesting in other ways too, because through Hallett's eyes, we see the artist's imagination as a sacred place, and in Edith's case, her studio is the, in the building called Burnt Coat. Um, is that sacred place? Um, is your writing room a sacred space for you? It's really not. It's just the kitchen table. <laughs> but um, I don't know. It's very interesting, isn't it? I think the partners of artists and writers, I think, often think that the room of creation or the space of creation, whether it's a studio or a study or wherever, is a kind of a place of alchemy and magic and a sort of occult nature but you know particularly Edith some of the structures that she's building are, are they're not occult but they're large and confrontational and, and probably disturbing and feminist um 
and 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 you do see that you do see the kind of um a, a sense of of the sacred with with the partners of artists who are sort of approaching their work and it can be in some ways more difficult i think for for the for women artists for kind of, you know because we live in a in a in a world that's been defined by kind of male work and and the female domestic and so for that to be reversed i think it's a, it's a tall order it can be tough i think for men you don't often hear stories of of the female equivalent of john le carre whose wife supported his career you know where's the kind of opposite of that there aren't many stories there um and so i think the reality is uh both with men and women, but particularly with women artists and writers, there is a sense that that you're doing something extraordinary, something strange, something disturbing, perhaps something from another realm. Um, but I really like in this story the way that Hallett approaches the situation, and some of it is almost a kind of a cultural respect. Um, mm -hmm. But there is a kind of curiosity and, and a sense of. Um, just being interested in what's happening and there's another moment in the novel where edith has created this uh sort of career defining sculpture which i imagine at scotch corner it's a sort of equivalent of the angel of the north but built by her and very different in some ways and her and hallett take a trip to the beach before lockdown and they they drive past it and she can hear him draw breath as they're approaching and this kind of this huge sculpture breaks the top of the trees as I imagine it, at Scotch Corner. I can see it every time I drive past. It just needs to be there. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, and she sort of, and she thinks, oh God, please don't let this relationship end because of who I am and what I make. And that is hard for people. And I think that's a reality. I think that's a reality. I think it's been easier to worship in male artists by women and expected in some ways the genius. But when it, when it's, functioning in women I think there are different questions in play so I did want to explore that a little bit in their relationship and he does rise to the challenge I have to say he does and in fact there are some 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 of the minor or smaller male characters um are essential really to Edith's development either as an artist or her ability to to work on this sort of monumental gigantic scale so initially we have Shun, the the person that teaches her the burnt um yeah. the burnt wood technique of how to make by by you know the refining fire, how to make the yeah. the wood more resilient. And then you have um uh, the character Sean who who helps her install these huge things and seems to have an innate understanding yeah. of what she's doing. And then uh, Unlike um, Edith's father, um, Hallett has a, a kind of, as you say, a kind of other cultural respect for the differences between them. But there's a lovely description early on where he he, he carries a bowl to their table as, as though it was a nest, a precious as a nest. Um, so it's quite interesting to see um, men in those sorts of roles and know that each of them will have their own st st fuller mm. story but right now we're focused on on um, on Edith and her work now um i was struck by a few similarities uh, between burnt coat and the kahalan army the futuristic setting the oppressive reality of the authoritarian state um, that has reached as far as as Rith in Kahalan army, the possibility of creating an alternative or self sufficient community of women, but the impossibility of sustaining it in that world. Um, but in Burnt Coat, the novel's present is set tw twenty years after the, the pandemic that's more horrible than COVID, which Edith has survived. Um, and throughout the book, love and sex and art are asserted against death. And I wonder, are Naomi Edith's mother's words at the beginning of the novel, the key to it, those who tell stories survive? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, so those are the opening lines to the novel. And because of the nature of, of uh, Naomi's brain damage, uh, 
she often mixes up her words. So in the beginning, Edith thinks that her mother's got the sentence the wrong way around and she should be saying those who survive tell stories. You know, of course, you know, the survivors of, of any event tell their stories. But to put it the other way around, you know, those who tell stories survive, it's almost like the act of telling is somehow involved in the mechanism of survival. And that is interesting to me, that concept, because I do think... There's another point in the novel where Edith says, you know, it's all art, everything is, even thought. So the idea is that, you know, our perception recreates the world for us. And in some ways that enables us to live through these difficult situations. You know, the kind of, if your perception was so bleak that there was no prospect of survival, if you couldn't tell yourself that it was going to be okay or that something made sense or you know, somehow process it that way, how how would you get through those situations? So Edith does interrogate this sentence in some ways throughout the novel um, and finds it to be accurate, I think, in many ways, even if she doesn't fully understand it. Um, so there was that exploration. Um, but I, uh, dr drawing a parallel between the two novels, as you have done with Carl Holland and Burnt Coat, there is definitely an interest in survivalism and how that is done and even in the face of eventual death which everybody will face and many of the characters do um what is it that that kind of gives a kind of human reconciliation you know is it the defiance of sister at the end of Carhullen? she might be held prisoner but she's still really defiant um or is it somehow edith just trying to reach for understanding you know the, I would say probably the main relationship in Burnt Coat, other than the love affair with Hallett and the relationship with her mother Naomi, Edith has a lifelong relationship with death. Not in a personified art history way, the kind of hooded Grim Reaper, but the void. You know, so it's not exactly a nihilistic novel, but it is a novel that explores mortality and the you know the temporal nature of human beings and edith is having to reconcile herself with that it colors her entire life because her, her mother is left with a condition where she might at any moment die um and so that is something that edith has to kind of metabolize when she's very young and there are various points in the novel where she's trying to understand it and through hallett it's lovely you know they get you get a kind of middle eastern culture and a western culture trying to explore death together, the biggest of all human, you know, challenges. Uh, and, it, and then Edith travels the world, you know, she's sort of watching a corpse decompose in Thailand with a group there. She's trying to understand the nature of death. And uh, I think that is the fundamental to the novel, the kind of, you survive, but you don't eventually. And how do we, how do we understand that? What story is left behind about each and every one of us? That's really what she's trying to figure out. Thank you. That's a terrific answer. I've noticed in your other books, as well as in this one, but in The Wolf Border, for example, and The Kohalan Army, the prose and its rhythms helps to bring the story to life. And here in Burnt Coat, it has a deftness and a poetic quality, yet it never loses its edge or its edginess. There's a passage towards the end of the book that shows this beautifully, and I wonder if you'd like to read it now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, if you're going to set up a pandemic in a novel, somebody has to get ill. It's just the, the way it is. Um, so it's not a spoiler alert, but uh, as to be expected. Um, Fairly far into lockdown, Hallett and Edith have been venturing out um, for various reasons and have been met with trouble and civil unrest. Uh, and Hallett has come off worst. At the table, you lifted your arm and reached for the salt. And I saw the rash around the point of bone. Wet, yellowish, with a halo of red. There were small bubbles under the skin with pale liquid inside. I caught your arm and held it. Some blisters had burst and their pus was already crusting. What? You tried to see, twisting your arm round, then went to the bathroom mirror and held up the elbow. Under your breath, you said a word I didn't recognize, then closed your eyes and your head fell back. I felt the first sick rising of alarm. Did you burn it or anything? Silence. Hallett? No. 
We'd both been counting the days, nine since you'd come back hurt. You faced the ceiling, blind, like the head of a plant waiting for light's instruction. I tried to find something to say. Then your attention snapped back. You opened your eyes and looked at me. Do you have anything? No, I don't think so. We have to check. We stood apart in the bathroom and undressed. There was no thrill. Even when you'd been hurt and I'd taken down your shorts, I'd noted for a fraction of a second the bones of your hips, the brownish penis in a nest of dark hair. My skin was clear. You made me turn several times, looking everywhere, in my armpits, the backs of my knees. The examination was horribly thorough. I'm fine. Please stop. No, turn again. Lift up your feet. Perhaps you were delaying. Hallett, let me look at you properly, please. You stood still as a pillar and I walked round, squatted. There were more marks on your lower back in the ridge between buttocks. They looked like infant sores, fever blisters, nothing I'd seen in adulthood, even when traveling. Do you think it's Nova? Your voice was small, urgent. Yes. I tried to hug you, but you held my shoulders and stood me away. No, come on, you can't do that. You walked out of the bathroom into the bedroom and began stripping the sheets. We have to wash everything. I've touched everything. Hallett, stop, please. You pulled the covers off the pillows, half frantic, half furious, full of self-reproach. I will clean here and then I will go back to my flat. I'm a fucking idiot. You bundled the sheets, held them between your fists, every muscle in your torso stark. Violence or flight, I didn't know you in this state, didn't know which might happen. Your face was concentrated, stony, the bruises on your temple faded to pale grey. No small dispute can prepare for the first real conflict, its size and sear. In another version, you took up your clothes, dressed and left, slamming the door. I did not see you again. It hangs there, the possibility in which we are cut apart and freed and lost from each other. In that version, emptiness reaches the edge of the frame. Nothing populates it. Everything is the colour of clay. My whole life is lived differently, or is not lived. But you were incapable of abandonment, of refusing kindness. Stop. I have it already, I said. If you do, I do. You shook your head and looked away. No, you don't. Yes. I walked forward and took the sheets and you let go hesitantly as if putting a small child into the sea. I dropped them and placed my hand on your chest. You kept shaking your head, denying everything, my touch, your acquittal, the disease. You can't leave. Please don't leave. Then we were in each other's arms. Thanks, Sarah. Right, so there are so many moments in the, in the novel um, that, as I said at the beginning, take your breath away, um, that being one of them. Um, can we talk a little bit <clears throat> about the form of the book? It seems to me to have the intensity of one of your short stories, but it sometimes somehow allows you to room to broaden your range, take in more characters and bigger story themes than a story might. So one question is, is it a novel, albeit a short one, or is it a novella? And is that, to your mind, even a useful distinction? sure if it's a useful distinction other than where you might put it on the shelf in a bookshop <laughs> um i think it's a novel um it it certainly feels like the novel of a short story writer somebody that's been working with short stories for the last decade um because i think the rigor of short stories um uh, and they are very rigorous has in some ways created a very lean novel um with quite a lot boiled off it 
that's not necessary uh, and some spaces for the reader to kind of bring bring to the book what they need to but also I think it it is complete it's dimensional and so it offers a, a full world um, in a way that the short story form might Oh, I don't know novel novella I, to me it doesn't really matter I think the experience of every piece of fiction is different the category doesn't matter it's about taking that ride with the author and the author's imagination it's about the reader being transported into a world that they believe in um, that that they can ask questions about that the writer is already asking questions about for the reader on their behalf um, I don't know. So uh, for, for me, it's not so much about form, although I am finding forms that feel to suit my work. And I feel that that uh, is, is still a journey that I'm on. But I think the operating keys of this novel are sensualities and all my work probably contains that quality. So it is about a kind of sensual journey in some way, which enables the reader to really kind of experience the, the world that's created, or at least that's the hope for the novel. Um, so it has a shape, you know, fiction has a shape. That's just how I regard it. No hard borders, no word count necessary, no um, academic kind of meaning beyond the fact that this book has a shape and hopefully it's its own correct shape and it suits what it's presenting and that's really the bottom line in the way I work um, if it transports if it moves if it makes a reader think if it makes them experience something that perhaps they haven't before or re-experience something they already have then I feel that it's been a success the fictional domain has worked and that's all I need to know about it it's a good, good answer um, I'm going to pursue this a little bit, but but only a little bit. I mean, I have a particular liking for for short novels because there are some great short novels. Um, one only has to think of um, um, Heart of Darkness, for example, or um, No One Writes to the Colonel or Chronicle of a Death Foretold by Gabriel Garcia Marquez or chess by Stefan Zweig and something there's a kind of in, intensity or a focus you can get in a short novel you think about um, Mikhail Bulgakov who wrote a wonderfully sprawling novel The Master of Margarita mm -hmm. also wrote a very tight novel about really about the creation could you engineer a human soul called The Heart of the Dog written in about 1925 I think um, in Russia and though it, the it may be something to do I just came across a number of shortish books um, at the right time, sort of 18, 19, 20. Henry James is The Europeans, for example, is a superb short novel. So um, I would argue that there are things that we can, um, that, that uh, a novella can, or a short novel can do and do better than a long form or a very short form like the short story. And now, Sarah, you seem to have disappeared or turned oh. into a... Um, I'm still here. Um, uh, you're still there. Okay, I'm your image there. has gone. You've been replaced by a space invader. Oh, no. <laughs> but um, we, we hope you'll come back so you're I'm, there. I haven't touched anything, I promise. <laughs> no, it, it'll be the... Um, it, it'll, be, it'll be either... Um, the um, Wi-Fi connection uh, at Litfest, or or it'll be your own Wi-Fi connection, and these things go up and down. But at least you're still there and can hear. So um, we, we talked a little earlier today. You you said I've mentioned some books that I really liked, and I've done it just now. And you you have a a, a list of several, and um, I'd like to in while you're telling me about oh, you're back again. Thank goodness. <laughs> Um, while you're telling me about the, the, the short novels that you've particularly enjoyed, I'd like to invite our audience to add to the chat any short novels, and I'll say, um, let's say, not less than 80 and not more than 200 pages, and just see whether we, we come up with some interesting 
ideas. But while they're doing that, and, and I will put some of mine into the chat as well, could you tell me about three or four of the books on the list you sent this afternoon you particularly like and, and why? Yeah, I'm finding three or four a challenge. So I'm just going to hold up my big stack. I was pulling them off my bookshelf when we were talking about this earlier. And just it's the, it's also one of my favorite forms. And you're absolutely right that there is a kind of quality of intensity, but fullness, I think, to the short novel that isn't to be found necessarily in another form. Um, and it's interesting that you mention age as well, actually, because I think I dis discovered that form when I went off to university and then in my 20s. And it's things like Wide Sargasso Sea, which might be over 200 pages, um, The Great Gatsby. Um, my first experience of Hilary Mantel was The Giant O'Brien, which is extraordinarily brilliant. And she also seems like a another author who is comfortable with the short petite powerful novel as we might call it or the big sprawling you know historical novel um and they're they're doing something very different uh, in her hands uh, beautifully so and and one is no less powerful than the other um so i've email, also emailed through a list which which might get put up i mean if i had to if i had to pick three or four i think I keep coming back to Michael Ondaje's Coming Through Slaughter, which I absolutely loved when I first read it. And I've read it several yeah, times. It's terrific. And it's it's so inventive and, and beautiful and interesting and seems to cover such a lot of ground just with a sort of vignette style and across a few pages. Um, this kind of poetic prose, again, the sort of poetic prose the artfulness of writing seems to sit really well within the short form. Um, so writers that are very dexterous and have a kind of poetic essence to their writing, I think often work well within that form. I mean, The Great Gatsby is obviously well known to be very, very crafted um, at the level of language and thought and concept. Um, another, another, well, another two. So the Sabat and Ali, Madonna in a fur coat, and Exit West by Mohsin Hamid, both wonderful, one's Turkish translation. Um, and Exit West was shortlisted for the Booker Prize the year that I was judging it. And the judges, we just really loved this book. I mean, it's very short. It's a kind of, you know, brilliant existential metaphysical novel, um, very imaginative, has a kind of concept of doors which transport refugees and immigrants to the next country that they find themselves in so it has this kind of it's not exactly a magic realism it's not that at all but this mechanism works beautifully in the book uh, to enable the two main characters to pass from country to country and and, and go through these different experiences um just really really wonderful I, i'm gonna i'm sorry i'm really sorry i'm gonna have to choose another two as well and hold them up peter hobbs in the orchard the swallows beautifully written right. Um, and I will say this, actually, my dad passed away recently from COVID. He's sadly very missed. I was reading this book in the hospital to him, the opening pages, and it's absolutely beautiful. It was exactly the right thing to read to somebody uh, at his stage. So I, I recommend that incredibly highly. And I've just um, read Mrs. Caliban for the first time, Rachel Ingalls. Uh -huh. It's being republished by Faber extraordinarily yeah. strange weird and again like the short story in some ways the short novel allows an author to play around with with magic and strangeness and um the fantastic and, and not have to keep it going for too long so that the reader might fall away and not believe what's happening anymore um so these weird brief experiences really stay with you and haunt you and and mrs caliban is so well done that way i mean it seems on the one hand so suburban and prosaic and and of and, and it just is completely other so i would recommend everybody rush out and buy it immediately yeah, so i'm sorry it. that was four or five bill no but it was great fun because <laughs> it, it it um it's it's helped to build up this reading list which we will post yeah what else on. have we got in the chat alif shabat 10 minutes and 38 seconds yeah yeah Great. so we now got 10 minutes to go so it's t high time we opened up to the audience for the q a and the questions are coming up in the chat and not in the chat in the 
ask a question box. So I'm just going to do, go through them in the order that they appeared. Um, so the first one is from Moira Garland. Uh, what prompts you to write either a short story or a novel? Are there particular reasons or scenarios where you would write one or the other? Yeah, just the idea for the basic idea arrives sometimes with a shape and a sense of heft and weight, and that will give me a clue as to whether it's it it, it could go f into long form or short form. I mean, the short stories. It's not that the subject matters are smaller or the episodes are kind of less uh, resonant, but um, I think the ideas for short stories are, are, are often stranger and unresolved in my mind. And it's, it's I'm asking a question through the story somehow uh, with no answer given necessary, which of course the short story really does allow you to do. Um, Novels to me feel like an exploration into a subject matter. So The Wolf Border could have been probably twice the length it is because I was so fascinated with the prospect of rewilding um, and the reintroduction of wolves and wolves as apex predators and land management and hierarchies, both human and animal and, and, and power, both animal and human. Um, uh, particularly in Britain, the sort of money that can back these projects and our class system. I mean, the wolf border could have gone on and on sprawling outwards. Um, and it's the longest thing I've written. And I was utterly, utterly fascinated with all the topics that I was covering. The Carhill and Army, I was, I was really fascinated too, but because a lot of it was sort of speculative um, research into peak oil and what might bring on an economic collapse and climate change flooding insurance crisis it felt had i had i built it in intimate detail it would have been trying too hard to convince you of this world that that has has gone to hell and so a few deft moves and a few terrible details like the enforced wearing of coils for women you know population control food rationing a, a few things seemed enough that, that uh, it wasn't going to be too much. It wasn't going to be sort of, you know, Tolkien kind of creating masses and masses of details in that world. I didn't want to do that. So there's always a sense of, of how to handle the material somehow. And a lot of it is worked out in the edit as well. But I think when I start, I've described it as, as like throwing a lump of clay on the wheel to make something the size of it, the kind of throw in the beginning, the sense of the shape really will define, you know, the idea and how much it can be crafted one way or another. But I generally have a sense of that at the beginning. Occasionally, I've just had no idea what I'm working with at all. And it, and it sort of becomes its own thing. But that can be a bit messy. <laughs> OK, it's a good question. Now, now talking about the, um, the wolf border, Joe Taylor says, um, I'm teaching the, whoops, I've lost her now. I'm teaching the wolf border in a couple of weeks, getting students to map it. I wanted to ask if you think of your novels in cartographic ways and if that sense of mapping places, which your novels do so deftly, affects the plot as well as the way you imagine place. And then she adds, um, how does a sense of place affect your prose? This yeah. is a thing that capital letters fascinates me. So that's a really good question because over the course of my career, which is probably 20 years now, I've moved from incredible topographical accuracy in the writing. So like cartography, basically, that is the valley. These are the place names. That's the square footage to a more unrestricted and um, recalibrated and imagined realm. I don't think I've ever moved away from the desire to really focus on creating place in a way that the reader will feel they're in that place when they're reading the book and to bring with me the legacy of the North. But Carhol and Army, obviously, it's High Street. You know, it's uh, there are those old fell farms up there. Um, there's no republic at the moment of Britain. There's been no government collapse. Uh, very tempted to add something to that sentence, but I won't. Um, 
there's no Northern Territory that's been redefined, but there are debatable lands, you know, uh, there. Are, <laughs> so it's a kind of play with history and accuracy and, and, and a kind of taking away of the borders and the boundaries. And I think that is fiction, isn't it? It allows you to do those wonderful things. The wolf border, there is no estate in Britain big enough for a self-sustaining wolf enclosure, not a healthy one. So I had to expand Cumbria. I had to expand the Lake District. I had to create an estate that would be big enough. Um, I mean, people are not complaining about the fact that that, that estate doesn't exist in Cumbria. Uh, you know, occasionally you do get people who are very passionate about the region popping up and saying, no, 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 that place name's wrong. Or that seems not to be happening anymore. Um, because I think my project has been mutability, you know, we, we recreate places, we recreate them in our mind and in our memory, we, we can speculate and create what if landscapes. So the Lake District is very important in my work, the North is very important in my work. And, and that means that every other place I try to write about is very important in my work as well. But the imagined space takes precedence now so you know burnt coat as well the cities are not really named i think istanbul and london are named um but the city in which edith lives it it's sort of carlisle it might it's sort of norwich it's certainly in the north but it doesn't matter um i hope there are enough details that, that again the reader feels like they're there but dislocation can be as profound as location and in some ways it's the more suitable option that's a very good answer. Now, um, we've got two questions on the same theme, so I'm going to run them together. Um, they both ask, effectively, um, why did you choose the structure of short paragraphs rather than chapters? In and they, they were from Ellen Arneson, and then the other one has just, oops, just disappeared on me. So if you could uh, answer that question, that would be great. Yeah, so I think burnt coat, it's it's almost like a memory piece. So the, the concept is that Edith is thinking back over her whole life and she's trying to find sense and meaning in it. She's focusing on the relationships which profoundly affected her, the experience that experiences that made her the person she is and the artist she is. And I think if if it had been too structured, if there'd been chapter titles or or numbers or any kind of apparatus, it would have felt invasive to her memory. And the way that memory often works is sort of this um, jigsawing, this synaptic uh, thing that kind of jumps around and, and, and we make meaning over several events. And sometimes we might join those events together, even if they weren't chronologically joined in our lives, because they do have a kind of resonance. So she is bringing together the pieces of her life in in the book and it's not really written down she's not really writing a diary the reader is asked to be be with Edith's experience as they read and it seemed the right approach to just create space between her thoughts space between her memories um to not dress them or or force them into boxes or give them a structure that wouldn't necessarily be there were we just in her mind with her so there's movement in there, there's art in there, there's a kind of control of the imagination in there, there's a control of reason, there's a control of memory, uh, and, a, and, a, and a pattern making, as humans do, we make patterns out of things. But I think if it had been more formally done than that, it would have seemed wrong for the nature of this particular novel. Okay, we we don't have time for one more question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, it goes like this, so a very short answer if you can, Sarah. I teach Kohalan Army and the Wolf Border as feminist texts. I'd love to hear how you think about gender and feminism in relation to your work. And that was from em uh, Emily Spires. Well, I'm completely delighted that these books are being taught on on courses about feminism, I would consider all the female characters in my work from Horsewater through to Edith and Burnt Coat to be uh, in some ways using the tools which feminism provides us with. Um, 
they're taking up space they're history makers they are capable they're agents they make mistakes they're human they're not necessarily overly strong they are just women being explored along the spectrum of what it means to be a woman and actually not what it means to be a woman because I don't just believe in a kind of feminine definition I don't feel that way I don't find those borders to be there so it's a sort of human exploration through these characters but they are women who are agents in their own lives in some way so I'm very pleased that the books are being are being taught within that framework and I would consider all my books to to fall within that framework I feel passionately about that well thank you Sarah for that really stimulating conversation and for answering all our questions and by the way for reading so beautifully you. now you can buy Sarah's new novel Burnt Coat and her superb collection of stories Southern Traveller and her other titles from the Litfest online bookshop and remember every purchase also helps us to fund future events and projects and before we all go our separate ways if you enjoyed today's event don't forget to click on the donate button on your screen or go to our website later if that's easier every penny will go towards creating exciting future projects and events strengthening litfest as an independent arts charity and will just simply enable us to continue our work so thank you everyone for joining us today i hope we'll see many of you in person at the um, at litfest or see many of you in person and or online at litfest because we don't know which way covid is going to go um, the programme will be announced immediately after Christmas. But now it is time to go. So please join me in thanking Sarah Hall once again. That was a terrific session. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.